Welcome to Washington Unplugged. I'm Bob Schieffer. Well, continuing our Behind the Ballot feature, we're going to talk today with Florida Democratic candidate for the Senate, Kendrick Meek, and what's going on now with Alabama coach Nick Saban. Did he really endorse a candidate in a local mayor's race in Alabama, as she claimed? Truth is, he didn't, but therein lies the tale, and our Kaylee Hartung will untangle it for us on this webcast. But first, to that very hot Florida Senate race and Kendrick Meek. Well, uh, uh, Mr. Meek, you of course are a member of Congress, succeeded your uh, mom in the seat you now hold now, and uh, you're running for the Senate. Uh, tough primary, but you've also, if you do win the nomination, are going to get into a three-way race. It will also include uh, Mark Rubio, the Tea Party guy, and uh, the man who's now an independent, uh, Charlie uh, Christ, who is the uh, the Republican governor now. So uh, President Obama came down and uh, campaigned uh, for you yesterday, but a lot of people are saying, where was he before? Uh, do you feel like he kind of left you out there for a while? No, I mean, the president early on said he was in support of my candidacy. The White House has answered the question constantly. And yesterday he came down and spoke very highly of our future governor, Alex Sink, who's in this uh, election cycle, and he had good things to say about me. We were able to catch a sandwich after um, the rally, and uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a good time, uh, not only for my campaign, but for Alex Sink's campaign. And giving Democrats direction in the primary is very important, especially um, when you have a billionaire running against you, which I have, that has spent over $24 million trying to win. You know, your, uh, your opponent, speaking of billionaires, uh, he is a billionaire, and uh, he says you're really just an insider, that uh, because your mom served in the Congress, that uh, you're, you're kind of part of uh, Washington, and you are in the Congress now, and uh, he says that's reason enough uh, for folks not to vote for you. How do you, have you been responding to that? Well, uh, first of all, you have to have a track record of service and a will and the desire to serve the people of the state of Florida. Uh, my opponent uh, just moved to Florida two years ago and was a Republican prior to that all of his life. Uh, he ran as a, uh, as a Republican in California. Uh, he is trying to ride the wave of, uh, well, you know, this guy is a career politician. I consider myself a public servant. I was a state trooper before I got involved in public service in the state legislature. And now in Congress, I've worked on issues of making sure we have lower credit card um, um, fees and interest rates on credit cards, but also um, dealing with the issue of protecting Social Security and standing up for our veterans. Our message has resonated with, with voters here in Florida, and we're going to do something that no one else has been able to do this election cycle, and that's defeat a billionaire at his own game. So we uh, are, have limited resources, but we feel that we have the grassroots campaign that will take us over the top, and my Florida story um, of service and commitment um, is prevailing right now with the voters. Well, I must say the polls do uh, bear you out in one thing. They show that you do have a uh, substantial lead uh, over this, uh, uh, this billionaire that, uh, that you're running against. Uh, but I want to ask you this. Uh, a lot of Democrats uh, seem to be saying that, well, uh, while Congressman Meek is a very good candidate, the fact is that Charlie Crist is in this uh, race uh, now as an independent, and uh, they seem to be supporting him because they think in the general election he may have the best chance to win. What are you telling those folks? We just started deploying our resources at the end of this primary because we were running against a billionaire and we couldn't afford to go two for two. I mean, you know. Uh, punch for punch with them. But in the general election, after we win this primary, Democrats would have selected um, the nominee on the issues um, as it relates to being the only pro-choice candidate that will be in a general election, the only candidate that was against offshore oil drilling off the coast of Florida before and after um, the BP spill. And I'll be the only candidate that has really stood up for the middle class uh, uh, tax cuts and willing to repeal the, the Bush tax cuts. Um, but also make sure that we watch out for small businesses um, in that process. I'll be the only candidate that's saying that and that has actually done it. And I think on the facts, um, the, the governor and, and Mr. Rubio are going to have um, a lot to explain uh, as it relates to holding the numbers. Every poll has said 
um, the governor will not hold the numbers that he has now once there is a Democratic nominee, once we start um, um, the machine of the get out the vote machine here in Florida. Um, and I feel that I'm a, a candidate that independents will vote for and also single digit Republicans. And plus we have a 600,000 uh, vote plus up here in Florida of Democratic voters. And I must say, and, and, and just to be fair, uh, you're uh, the candidate you have to beat, the, the one that seems to be posing the main uh, obstacle to you in this primary. Uh, I refer to him as that billionaire. I should say the man's name is uh, Jeff uh, Green, and uh, he, he is the one you face uh, in this primary. I, I also note that uh, while we haven't seen much of, Bill, uh, uh, much of uh, President Obama down there, that Bill Clinton has really been... Uh, taking your side and has uh, campaigned for repeatedly for you there. Has that helped? Well, that's correct. Bill Clinton was a support, supporting me last year and this year, and he's going to continue to do so. Um, but the support of both President uh, Obama and President Clinton will give direction um, to a number of Democrats. I think Democrats are wanting to make sure that we win this seat in Florida. And once they see someone like myself emerge out of this race that many counted me out and when they when the billionaire got involved and in saying oh it's no way in the world Kendrick will be able to compete with um, a billionaire but once we start talking about the issues that really matter in Florida and I can tell you um, the governor has been all over the board on his positions in a recession I think it's even more um, important that you elect someone uh, that you know that will stand by your side and be with you in the muddiness of life and I believe that it will pay off in the very near future. And I'm very, very excited about this three-way race because I believe that it will be a contest all the way to the end. And it will be about who gets out to vote um, in the election. And I, um, I, I'm, 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 I can't wait until Tuesday um, to uh, be able to win this race. And we're going to be working um, until then. Our shirts will be sticking to our backs, but uh, we'll, we'll make it through. All right. Well, uh, Congressman, I want to tell you, it's, some, it's, it's one of the races that uh, everybody in the nation is going to be focused on uh, come November. So uh, we wish you uh, good luck on the campaign trail and uh, uh, another in our series of behind the ballot uh, interviews on the uh, key races around the country. Thank you, Congressman. And now we're Thank going you. to have a little sports. And for that, we're going to turn to the newest reporter for the CBS College Sports Network, our own Kaylee Hartung who's my colleague on Face the Nation and CBS News here in Washington, and who's getting a new job uh, starting this fall. She's going to be reporting sports uh, for the CBS uh, Sports uh, College Sports Network. Kaylee, i got to say, though, uh, starting right off, your experience covering politics here is going to give you a leg up on this uh, sports beat on this Nick Saban story. He, of course, is the uh, head coach at uh, defending national champion Alabama. And a lot of people thought, uh, surprisingly thought, I think, that he had gotten himself all uh, involved in a local mayor's race down there in Alabama. Uh, not so fast, though. That would have been a great boost for this candidate, but it was not seen what it seemed to be. Tell us what happened. Untangle this <laughs> mess for us. No, it wasn't, Bob. You really can't make this up. So a couple of days ago down in Bessemer, Alabama, it's a suburb of Birmingham, flyers started popping up. One of the candidates for mayor, Dorothy Davidson, seemed to have the ultimate endorsement, an endorsement from Nick Saban. So there's this, this nice picture of the two of them together, and a couple local papers started doing some digging. The University of Alabama, their athletic department, was very quick to correct this and say, in no way has Saban endorsed a candidate for mayor. Turns out the photo was actually one of Saban and his wife, Terry, and a campaign manager had gotten a little crafty with Photoshop and uh, done some editing for his candidate. That campaign manager has since been fired. The candidate has uh, admitted uh, the uh, misunderstanding and the error. And uh, <laughs> we'll see what happens. But, uh. In full disclosure here, I have to say that you and uh, Nick Saban go way back because you are from Baton Rouge and you've had a long association with LSU. Mm -hmm. It also occurs to me, Kaylee, 
that while this would have been, if it had been a real endorsement mm -hmm. by Nick Saban, it would have been a great boost for that candidate Huge. in Alabama. Yeah. It would not have been. That would destroy. Let's, let's find a, uh, a race in, in Louisiana now where somebody's going to have the idea to, uh, you know, sabotage their competitor's campaign by saying Nick Saban endorses them. That's a way to destroy because, a campaign in Louisiana. Uh, Nick Saban left LSU. He sure and, did. Uh, and, and to take the job in Alabama. Well, there was, there was a stint with the Miami Dolphins in between. Yeah. So, yeah. But I have to say, uh, my, I, my sources say that when uh, Nick Nick Saban comes back to Baton Rouge now that he he brings plenty of security with he better. him. better. <laughs> because in uh, Alabama and Louisiana, as we all know, uh, they don't just play football down mm. there. They live football. Football might be a religion, but there's a reason for separation between church and state. He doesn't need to get involved in politics. <laughs> all right. Uh, well, let's talk a little bit about uh, about your new job. You're going to be um, you're going to be working uh, for the CBS uh, College Sports Network, and yeah. what are you going to be doing? So I'm going to be uh, reporting from the sidelines of the Navy games, just up the road to Annapolis. Uh, really excited. You know, they've got a great quarterback in Ricky Dobbs. I think he's going to be a very dynamic character to follow, and uh, they could. They're poised to have a pretty good season. So I'm thrilled to be right there and be a part of the CBS College Sports Network. A lot of a lot of developments on uh, college football last night. Is late last fact. night. We continue to have these teams leaving one conference going to another yeah oh realignment is not over so there's a lot of speculation right now that BYU is going to try to leave the Mountain West and go independent have a deal similar to Notre Dame's which I know you're not a fan of <laughs> um, but so uh, late last night the Mountain West uh, conference announced that Fresno State and Nevada have now joined the Mountain West a lot of people, there's a lot of, a lot of talk about what this means. Um, Dennis Dodd, a great sports writer for CBS Sports, says he thinks the big winner here is the BCS. Because after all of this talk of, you know, should we move to a playoff system? You know, what's wrong with the BCS championship bowl series and all of that? You know, Orrin Hatch has been one of the biggest opponents of the BCS. But now with Utah moving to the Pac-10 in 2011, and if BYU is an independent, will he give up that fight and and of course those of us who are tcu grads uh, we kind of have a dog in this fight Absolutely. Full, full disclosure here uh, our beef with the bcs is that if you're in the mountain west uh, conference which my school tcu is you don't get an automatic bid to a bcs bowl and these are the big bowls uh, of course uh, you have to be invited. As TCU, we did get into the Fiesta Bowl last year, but here's the deal, and here's the beef that we have, and it's the beef that uh, Orrin Hatch has. You know, if you get into a BCS Bowl, and that's the TCU Horn Frogs right out there, uh, and you just saw, that's Coach Gary Patterson right there. Uh, when you get into a BCS Bowl, that's worth about $4 million. If you get into one of these lesser bowls, uh, it's probably $750,000. Now, here's the rub. Uh, everybody who doesn't get into a BCS bowl gets zero, except Notre Dame, because they're an independent. They get $1.3 million just because they're Notre Dame, and some of us have a problem with that. So uh, I noticed, uh, well, as a matter of fact, uh, your friend Gary Patterson, the head coach at TCU, uh, had a little advice for BYU. He sure did. He sure did. He said if, if, B, if this is the way BYU is looking to win a national championship by going independent, this is not the way to go. Let's just play some football. Let's just play some football. Yeah. Uh, how do you think, we, you know, for all the shakedowns in these conferences, those things will take place next year? 2011. So, you know, there are these moves. You know, you've got Nebraska moving conferences. And like I mentioned, you know, Utah, all of this, nothing takes effect until 2011. So we've got one more season, the way it all stands now. And then... Uh, things will start to change. And getting back to Nick Saban, most of the preseason puts Nick Saban's team Absolutely, number one. at number one. Um, you know, it's, and it's hard to imagine Nick Saban not having a, a great defense, but that's the only weakness that people are thinking about. I want to say they lost nine starters um, after last season, so if they have any ground to make up, it's on defense. But I also have <laughs> to say that uh, TCU ranked uh, generally sixth or seventh uh, mm -hmm. in most of the preseason polls. Uh, a lot of people think has a better ball club than they had last year when they went undefeated until they until they got to the Fiesta Bowl. Mm -hmm. I still say we have the best quarterback that nobody knows in college football today, and that's Andy Dalton. So uh, it's gonna I be hope a fun you'll season. find a way to do some stories about TCU, Kayla. If you have anything to do with it, I'm sure I will. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you very much, <laughs> Thanks, and congratulations Bob. on your new job. Thank We're you. all we'll all be watching.
All right. Well, thank you all for watching Washington Unplugged. And join us right here every day on CBSNews.com. I'll see you Sunday on Face the Nation when our special guest will be the author of Three Cups of Tea, Greg Mortensen, who's now uh, required reading for every U.S. officer going to Afghanistan. I'm Bob Schieffer. Have